All right. Victory Tuesday, man. We're finally off the schneid. <laughs> Got the offense rolling, baby. 27 points against the New England Patriots. They put up 17. Not too far from my prediction. I want to just highlight that real quick before we get into this thing. I said 27-13, yeah. man. We were real, real close to hitting that right on the money. Yeah, so my dad texted me as soon as uh, we wrapped up the show, or as soon as the game was over, and he was like, man, Dan was close. And I was like, yeah, he's uh, he's one of two when it comes to predictions on the show, man. He is the front runner out of the both of us. So he is the, uh, the, the prize money when it comes to the fastest 40. That's for sure, bud. So. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's eyes on it, man. It doesn't go unseen, that's for sure. That's too much praise, man. I uh, that's too much praise, but I am pretty excited. I was like, I was like, okay, that felt good. That felt good to get that one really, really close. Would yeah, have been nice yeah, to nail yeah, it though. To yeah, no, I hear you. It's tough to do, bro. It's tough to do. <laughs> we had to turn one more seven into a three, and we would have been right there. But. uh no, a lot of fun stuff to talk about in the show today. Obviously, you know, we're coming off a win. That's feeling good, right? We're going down the stretch run. Three games left in the NFL season. The entire AFC is up in the air. I mean, everything is up for grabs, right? Uh, the Tennessee yep. Titans, they just got eliminated this weekend. But other than that, man, everybody else is sitting at 7-7, seven and 8-6, seven, and 9-5, and 10-4. and four. Um, It's neck and neck, dude. So. A lot's going to shape out, so we'll talk about some news for the Chiefs. We'll get into our player of the game, recap the Pats, and then touch on the AFC landscape to really flesh out what the rest of the the last three weeks of the regular season is going to look like, man. I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, as far as predicting goes, I have no way. I have no way of like guessing what's going to happen over the next three weeks because I did not see this season playing out the way that it has so far. Yeah, same here. But I think, you know, after specifically after last weekend, you can kind of see things to kind of morph into shape here. I, I see it's a it's going to be a long stretch for the Chiefs to try to lock up that one seat. I think that is um, pretty improbable at this point, but it's it still it still could happen. But uh, yeah, things are kind of starting to fall into place for the AFC specifically. And things have really shaken up in the NFC over the last couple of weeks with the Eagles dropping three in a row. but. Man, December football, baby, it's fun. It's a good time to yeah. watch football right now, and it's it's just a blast, dude. It's a lot of fun. I don't know if you watched that Monday night football game. We don't. We usually record on Monday nights, so it was nice getting a little bit of a a reprieve last night. Watch watching some Monday night football. Shout out to Drew Locke, man, Kansas City native, Mizzou, yeah. uh, former Mizzou player. Drop that right in the bucket for JSN to take the Eagles down. I mean, that's uh, not not Chiefs news necessarily, but definitely noteworthy for uh, for us here in Kansas City. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, dude is emotional too, and that's fun to see oh, from football phenomenal. players when they get emotional on the on the field. So uh, whether it's the South Side like we saw from Pat a couple of weeks ago, or it's Drew Lock on the on the top of the game, so it, yeah, it, it makes football fun. You can tell his attitude is gratitude, like very thankful for everything, very thankful for his teammates, very thankful for the coaches and the situation he was in. And I think that's what brought all that emotion out for him, which absolutely you said it best, right? You love to see that from a player You, when you can tell they actually care about the game and they're passionate about it, especially yeah. for a player yeah, like Drew Locke, who really doesn't get too many opportunities to start in this league anymore. Um, pretty awesome. Absolutely, man. Yeah, I agree. So let's roll into some Chiefs news here, Dan. Bring us in, buddy. Yes, sir. So Ed Bud, offensive guard. Um, it was just announced by the team that he passed away today. So um, passed away at the age of 83. Rest in peace to a Chiefs Ring of Honor member. Also a Chiefs ambassador for quite a long time. Uh, plenty of accolades. This guy stacked up while he was in the league, right? Super Bowl four champion a part of the AFL all-time team, which is an incredible honor for, for anyone that was named to that team after they merged with the NFL. Four-time All-AFL, two-time as a first team, two-time second team, and then seven total Pro Bowls. I put that in parentheses. Two of those were Pro Bowls. Five of those were all uh, AFL All-Star games. So 
you know, rest in peace to a, to a Chiefs legend, really. Uh, someone who who anchored that offensive line for us during our heyday in the 1960s and 70s and, and ultimately helped secure a championship, the first Super Bowl title that the Chiefs earned here in Kansas City. So pretty awesome stuff that he was able to do and obviously made a huge impact in the community as well, being a Chiefs ambassador and and lending his time to their various efforts throughout the years, throughout the decades, really. So, um, you know, rest in peace to a, to a Chiefs legend. And, um, you know, it's real sad. It's real sad that a lot of those players from that era, man, their, their time is coming. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where you just got to cherish it while they're here, give them their flowers and that sort of thing. I feel like uh, the worst thing that can happen is they get their flowers after they're gone. Um, so, you yeah. know, I think it's our responsibility as Chiefs fans to remember remember those players, what they did, and and how they built something like what we have here in Kansas City. Uh, they they laid the the foundation for it. So, yeah, yeah rest absolutely. Easy. And, and outside, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Dan. You finished what you're saying there, bud. No, that was it. That was all I had, man. Okay, okay. So I, I think something's important to, to to note here is that you know he had a lot of on field greatness that we saw in Chiefs uniform, but the greatness that Kansas City loves is the guys that not only stick around and impact the community, but the guys that do it while they're playing for the Chiefs, right? They're, so they're not just playing great football on the field, being that guy on the field, the cornerstone on the field for the team, but they're a huge impact on the community in the KC Metro area. And, and I think that's something that, you know, if you if you talk to 80 or 90 percent of these legends that we have here in Kansas City, they'll say that they love the city more for the community more than they did than just being having fans or being a part of the Chiefs organization. It was more about being the, in the community of Kansas City. And I think that's what makes a lot of our players super special in Kansas City. And I, I oh, think yeah. that's what brings, you know, a lot of the fans into the Chiefs as well. Like we almost feel like a part of the team in that fact where, um, you know, these guys could could leave the team and be an ambassador and you could rub shoulders with these guys at different events, you know, whatever it may be throughout the year. And I think that's a cool part. You know, these guys are human too. And for, oh, yeah. you know, guys like you and I to be able to mingle around with those guys and have conversations and, and be at an event for the same cause or whatever it may be, I think that's a special factor for guys in Kansas City. And I, I think it means something when somebody comes here to play football and then stays here for the rest of their lives, right? So, I, I you know, that's a that's a big thing for me. I think that speaks a lot for Kansas City. And, uh, yeah, RP, my man. And, uh, 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 yeah, that's all I got to say, man. Special, special part of Kansas City, that's for sure. So, um, Let's move on to some recent news, you know, mm -hmm. as it goes to on the field there, Dan. Um, Zach Ertz and actually another guy too, Justin Houston, um, two guys that Chiefs fans have been talking about maybe getting signed or wanting to get signed on the Chiefs team right. to make this push into January and February. Either one of those guys kind of have any interest from your your standpoint there, Dan? Uh, not necessarily. You know, I don't know how much guys like – Ertz and Justin Houston are really going to move the needle. Um, Ertz, obviously a talented tight end. Him and Kelsey coming from the same draft class. You hear him talk about how Ertz was taken ahead of him all the time. And, you know, would he be an upgrade over Noah Gray or Blake Bell? Sure. But do we really want him eating into Noah Gray's time on the field? Probably not. We want to give him some more opportunities, let him develop more as he's a young player. So, I mean, you know, wh where does he fit into the equation? I'm not entirely sure, right? Now, I'm not saying the Chiefs don't have a need for a pass catcher. This guy's hands have got to be better than, you know, the other five receivers <laughs> on our depth chart right now, other than Rishi Rice. I mean, is there an opportunity for him to come in if we were to sign him hypothetically and make an impact? I mean, yeah, there's definitely the opportunity there. But, you know, I don't think with the limited cap that we do have, I don't think it's really worth it to to run the roll the dice with him. Now, with Justin Houston, I'd just be interested in that to bolster, you know, our our edge rushing and get some more guys in rotation. You can never have, in my opinion, you can, you can never have too many talented edge rushers and you know, it would eat into 
some of the opportunities that you know FAU and um, and like a mini Hugh would get in those scenarios. But yeah, I mean Justin Houston is a a savvy veteran, right? He he has a history here in Kansas City. Spags would definitely exploit his talents in the best way and and help get some pressure on the quarterback. Um, I mean, I'm not opposed to bringing him in on a on some sort of a team friendly deal. His desire is to play for a contender, and what better place to go than the place you started? So, um, you know, there's rumors of bad blood there. Not to get too swifty on everybody, but uh, you know, with with Justin Houston um, in in his exit from Kansas City. So I don't know how much that would play in, into the equation, but. I mean, I would, I would not mind seeing him suit up and and Chiefs red again. Yeah, no, I think I, I think I'm on the same page as far as Zach Ertz. I don't think he's got a role in our offense. I think we're already way too heavy at tight end as it sits right now. You know, Blake mm-hmm. Bell still gets a lot of snaps. He's a he's a pretty good pass or uh, a run blocking tight end, and we primarily see him on those on those goal line touches or those mm-hmm. third and shorts, but. I, uh, I I don't think Zach Ertz has a role, and I, I really don't think Justin Houston has a role. That's really tough for me to say because I was a huge Justin uh, Houston advocate when he was playing ball here. I got the jersey hanging up in the closet. Like I'm a, I'm a big oh, yeah. Justin Houston guy, um, and I'm a big defensive player guy. And really, that came from that when him and Tom Bali were on on both or on opposite sides there, man, lethal. But uh, I don't think he's got a role either. I, I think, like you said, our, our rotations are already deep enough to where. I don't think Justin Houston taking up a roster slot is going to be a benefit to this team moving forward into January and, and February. So I, I'm not sure that's that's the that's the pick for us moving forward. I, I don't think that puts us ahead of anybody else as it sits right now. Yeah, you know, it's definitely not going to be that thing that catapults us into automatically getting the one seed, that huge impact kind of guy. Um, but I could absolutely see us pulling him in and just bringing him as like a Terrell Suggs kind of role, uh, what we saw in that Super Bowl run, or maybe even a Melvin Ingram type of role uh, moving forward where, you know, he doesn't get 50, 60 percent of the snaps, but 20, 15, 20 percent rotate him in on third downs, second downs, early downs, something like that. Um, finding that situation for him, if we did bring him in, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be upset to have him back. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. Yeah, I guess it yeah, it would be cool to see him back in New Jersey, but uh yeah, I just don't see that being the move for us right now. Yeah, for sure. Moving into Patrick Mahomes, Walter Payton Man of the Year. They have their charity challenge. Essentially, that's the, you know, hashtag WP M O Y on Twitter. And Mahomes is in third place, which I know that does count for something in that race. So just using this opportunity to raise some awareness and and uh, highlight some of the things he does with his 15 the Mahomes Foundation here in Kansas City. They're giving back to several charities that impact children here locally in Kansas City, but also where he's from out in Texas. So um, a lot of impact things that they're doing. You know, we saw him do uh, some stuff for voting, bringing opportunities to people that are kind of on an island there. Back during the election, we've seen him do uh, some different things with like vaccinations and helping people get that back when COVID was going on. So he's definitely involved in the community and making sure that people are getting an opportunity to feel his support and feel the impact and and trying to make change, positive change across the board here in KC. So, you know, super proud to have him obviously on the field, but all the stuff that he does off the field just speaks to his character, which is just makes the the comments about his his like sideline explosion, his referee comments, even more head scratching because that dude does more good than just about anybody in the National Football League. And, you know, if not, he's right on par with with the guys that are making the largest impacts, too. So um, love having 15 here in Kansas City. Obviously, everything he does on the field is incredible. But, uh, you know. Would love to see him get that Walter Payton Man of the Year patch on his jersey for sure, because he carries that for the rest of his career if he earns it. 
Yeah. So, I mean, that's right back to the same comment about uh, Ed Bud, right? So, I mean, guys that impact the community are, are huge for Kansas City. And it feels like Patrick Mahomes was born and raised here and then got drafted by Kansas City the way he impacts the community. So, if mm-hmm. anybody deserves it, you know, I know there's guys out there in the NFL that do deserve it and, and do great things for the community. But um, I, I know from just seeing the impact Pat Mahomes has had here in Kansas City um, that he, he makes a lot of mountains move here here in town. So uh, that's yeah. always appreciated. But um, I, I think whether or not he gets it this year, he will get it someday. I, I don't think that's a question. And uh, it might not be this year, but it, it will come for sure. So, um, Dan, let's jump into the game that we just saw Sunday at noon. Um, Chiefs traveled up to New England and beat the Patriots 27 to 10. As you said, you were just three points off. Or four points off that uh, that prediction there. Three points? Did you say 27-13? 27. It was 27-17. That's a typo there on the on the sheet. But uh, yeah, 27-13 was, oh, sure, sure, was my was sure. my prediction yeah, yeah. on 13, the game itself. Yeah, so just yeah. four points off. Just four points off. <laughs> yeah. There we go. There we go. There we go. I was trying to I was trying to rack my brain there. Um, Daniel, as numbers. we saw by a. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> between between <laughs> spreads and, and player props and scores and Monday Night Football attacking on right on the end of that, uh, there's a lot going on. But uh, <laughs> as we saw an increase in play from the Chiefs, you know, this week compared to the last four four weeks, player of the game, who are you rocking with this week? I got to give a shout out to CEH, man. The highlight reel catch that he put up, he just basically climbed the ladder to grab that ball in the back of the end zone come down with it. He ended up having four catches, 64 yards and a touchdown through the air as well as 37 yards rushing on the ground. Obviously CEH is not some prolific runner, but he does make impacts in the passing game. When you get him out in open space, he can make things happen. And uh, that's what we saw in this game. He got 20 of those rushing yards on just one carry. So, you know, that explosiveness is there whenever his vision is right. And I don't think he's going to be the everyday guy for us moving forward. But knowing that he can rotate in while Pacheco's getting well, I think is a huge nod to him. And just want to give him a shout out because he does get a lot of flack here in Kansas City. Yeah, I think that's that's been well deserved, you know, from what we've seen from CEH for the last couple of years. So I'm I'm personally (laughs) not too sold on him yet. I I need consistency. You know, Isaiah Pacheco has obviously proved that he can be the guy. So I'm not going to buy in quite to yet i don't think he's uh he, he's gonna be able to take you know i'm not even down for oh yeah i'm not round. saying he's our second every down touch. guy at all at all i think his I'm role is saying he's down. second touch bro <laughs> I, i'm still rocking with jarek on the second touches but uh, <laughs> uh my pick of the game's got to be rasheed rice so dude continues to climb the ladder here at just is still a line from me there with the uh yeah. he, he went for nine for 91 with one touchdown um, he continues to get better every single week. There was a highlight, I think, from his first catch they, uh, from the game where he turns around the middle of the field and you see his head just on a swivel, man. He's looking for defenders. He's trying to find that gap in the defense there in the middle of the field because everybody's bracketed up on Travis Kelsey, exactly how you told us that um, New England was going to play Travis Kelsey, right? So the middle of the field is wide open for any guy, any uh, anybody else not named Travis Kelsey. Rasheed Rice did a great job of finding those holes in the defense on Sunday. Um, I, I got to give a an honorable mention here. And somebody – I know we've mentioned a couple times on the show throughout the season, but it's got to be Harrison Bucker. Man, this is uh, first field goal of the season on the first kick there. You know, we talked about the weather in the pregame show that we did at the live at the Atlas where it was 25 to 35 mile-per-hour winds. He misses the first one. He was perfect on the season before that. The man hits 23 straight on the season. His last miss before that one on Sunday was, I think, New Year's Day or New Year's Eve, they said, last year. So, uh, man, uh, tough to see. But, man, consistency out of somebody who struggled so much last season and caught so much shit last season. So many people called for him to get cut. And, uh, you know, both of our, both of us were on the show calling for fans to, you know, just give the dude a shot, let him fix his mistakes. He, he, he had a, he had a tough year last year after that injury. Um, but as we saw through this year, man, he really did bounce back. He's had a great season and he's going to be a huge factor for the chiefs to win games in January and, and February. So, you know, let's keep riding this train with Bucker for sure, man. So, um, Oh yeah. 
With that yeah, being I mean, said, he, with that being said, go ahead. He was bro. a little bit injured too, right? So glad he's glad he's made that full recovery. And I think you're getting ready to transition into the injury report, right? Better homes and gardens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, better homes and garden, uh, specifically my wife Katie Lawrence. Uh, she serves the Kansas City metro area on the Missouri side as of now. She's working on the Kansas side, but she's going to help you do all the dirty work when you're trying to buy, sell, or build a home. So if you need somebody to represent you throughout the buying and selling process, be sure you're calling my wife, Katie Lawrence, with Better Homes and Garden at 816-868-1920. She's going to take care of you. But uh, Dan, do, do your work on the injury report, man. Yes, sir. Sky Moore. He ended up tweaking his knee. He had some swelling in it after the game from from what the reports that I've been seeing on uh, Twitter and and on some of the chief sites. And he's going to be headed to the IR. Um, unfortunately for him, that likely spells the end of the regular season. Maybe they activate him before the playoffs. But I mean, just three games left. It's going to be a tight window to get him into a position to play. At that point, I foresee this being the end of a season. Personally, maybe they get McCall Hardman back off the IR to kind of supplant him on the on the depth chart. But, you know, it's been alluded to that this is almost like um, coincidental of his of his performance that maybe, you know, the injury might not be as serious as it as it is. I mean, if if that's the case, you know, this might be an injury that's lingered with him for for the season. And finally, they're like, shut it down, reset for the offseason. Let's get you geared back up for 2024. I mean, I could see that being the case if 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 that's what it is. But we all know that Sky Moore is definitely underperformed up to this point. Um, you know, you never want to see a guy get hurt. Obviously, that's never, never going to be the camp that I'm sitting in. But, you know, I hope that you know, this ends up being something positive for him in some way, shape or form where, you know, he's able to retool and get some confidence. I think that's ultimately the problem here with him is he just doesn't have that confidence to go out there and perform. And, you know, who knows what's going to happen with him. But, you know, two years in a in a Chiefs uniform has not played out very well for him. And then Travis Kelsey, right, he yeah. falls on that elbow in the middle of the game. Definitely shake shook him up a little bit. Uh, just something to monitor. He is 34, so you know those bumps yeah. and bruises bruises tend to uh, carry a little bit more weight now at that age than it did maybe four or five years ago. So uh, something to watch as he goes through his practices. I bet they keep him on a you know a, a short leash as far as what kind of work he's doing. But just a couple of those injuries to to highlight there. Yeah, for sure. And, and to jump into Sky Moore a little bit, the way I kind of pictured that, you, you said it well, but the way I kind of I pictured that was like, hey, his knee is swelling. OK, let's ditch this dude. You know, he's 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 had some problems on the field, whether he had issues with the knee you know, last several weeks or the whole season. I don't know. I never saw anything until now that he was having issues with the knee. And so it kind of felt like, hey, this guy and at this point is is not putting us a step forward he's putting us a step back let's 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 move on see what else we can we can produce out of the wide receiver room without sky Moore. so um honestly it kind of felt like the the toy story movie where um he's like i don't want to play with these toys anymore it kind of drops him off you know what i'm talking about i was like damn that's kind <laughs> yeah. of old but <laughs> that nightmare <laughs> the vibe i got what he has me. good god yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh before we dive into uh, offense defense here, uh, bring us in with some e coffee here, Dan. Yeah, dude, nothing uh, nothing wakes you up like a cup of e coffee or a shot of their espresso. I know that's that's our our go to here in the Portillo house. Uh, Casey Local Coffee Company, my good friend Joel Graybill and his family own and operate that company. They roast the beans here in Kansas City and get them where they need to go. But the best part is they're actually sourcing those from all over the world. So, uh, so a little bit about their story. Essentially, their their dad was a hobbyist, big time coffee brewer, and they took up his hobby and essentially turned it into the business it is today and dedicated that to his memory. So, uh, pretty fantastic what they're doing there at eCoffee and definitely something that I love to support. 
KC Local, of course, it is the holidays. Perfect thing to stuff in a stocking if you get the opportunity to uh, put it in order. You can check them out, www.eeroastscoffee.com. Let's move it into the defense to start things off as we get into our game points. Defense has been the number one part of our team, so I think it's only right we start there. Drew Tranquil, Nick Bolton, they got to be on the field together. It's been awesome seeing them together in five games. We're four and one. Uh, That's just under half of our total wins uh, with both of those guys on the field healthy at the same time. And that defense is only allowing 13 points per game while they're both on the field. That is a noticeable difference, you know, from what we've seen in some of these other games, right? Having both of these guys who can quarterback the defense, coach everybody up. If one has to rotate out, grab some O2. The other guy, you know you can trust him to be out there and run the uh, run the defense and make the right calls and, you know, call out those plays as they happen. So, you know, having two of those guys on the field at the same time is such a big benefit for us and I think has been the the true difference for our defense this year. Um, and they did it again, man. They held held a team to just 17 points. Uh, anytime you're going to hold a team to less than 20, you're in good shape. You're in good shape to win. So love seeing that. And we were finally able to force some turnovers, right, including the Willie Gay pick. I thought he was going to the end zone, man. He was like five yards away, just right <laughs> there. Uh, like just he took the the Pacheco route and opted for the contact instead of trying to find the window. Um, I would have loved to yeah. see him break through that and get to the end zone. Yeah, that was exciting, man. I didn't realize when he caught the ball that he was on like the 30 yard line. And then once he hit like the 20, I was like, holy shit, my man's about to score. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you got to you got to find a hole, man. There, He's got the CEH vision on the defense. But uh, um, <laughs> on the same point, you know, creating some sacks there too, four sacks and and a guy named Chris Jones isn't one of the four, right? So we had other guys, you know, producing on the defense here, which is great to see. And really you're starting, we're not starting to see, we've been seeing, we've been watching this all season really where the defensive backs have been creating a situation up front where we could rush four. And if Spags does those creative blitz packages, like he does so much where we're getting on the quarterback quick, man. And it's really benefited us on the back end to where we can, we can man up. We have solid cornerbacks where we can man up. And we got solid guys over the top, so we can trust those guys um, over the top and underneath, really. And the, and the backers do a great job as well, too, in, in the pass coverage. So it's really creating those opportunities for the front four to to, to let loose, go upfield, and uh, make some plays in the backfield. But um, another guy in the backfield, Justin Reed, man, absolute tackling machine. He's a, he's a, he's sideline to sideline, just like Nick Bolton is. Um, just a guy that plays – until the whistle's done, man. He, he's one of those guys that gets after play after play, leading the team in tackles as is. And, I mean, he just gets after it, man. He, he's a factor just a in gym every rat. single play. <laughs> yeah, man. Just got grit. You know what I mean? Just a gritty-ass grit. dude. Just a gritty dude. <laughs> no, I, could, I mean, you couldn't say it better, right? He he definitely is one of those dudes that just – he's like a linebacker in a – and a safety's body, right? Uh, some of the stuff that some of the tackles I've seen him make just like blowing dudes up, like so much power. And obviously he went to Stanford. So real smart player too. Um, bringing that, bringing that football IQ to the field for our team has definitely been a plus since he's been here. So man, so awesome. So awesome. Having a defense that you can brag about, like we haven't had this in so long. So I just, I'm, I'm relishing every minute of it. <laughs> Yeah, it's fun, man. It's it's been fun. So the offensive side of the ball, right? Uh, Rasheed Rice, he gets that little toss underneath, gets his seventh touchdown in the game, setting the rookie record held by Dwayne Bow for receiving touchdowns at seven. He's second amongst current rookies with three games to go. Uh, the only rookie ahead of him is Jordan Addison with nine touchdowns. Pretty crazy. I didn't realize he was he was that had that many. Um, but but Rasheed Rice is right there, man. Yeah, I, I think there's a, you know there was a good amount of conversation going on so far this week about uh, Rasheed Rice if he continues to have and and you know if he has a baller next three games where 
you know, is he in the rookie player of the year conversation? I think with the CJ Stroud injury, you know, a lot of other guys are starting to bounce up and and be a part of that conversation where CJ Stroud really dominated the field there for the first three quarters of the season, right. Without the injury. And uh, so it'd be exciting to see how he finishes. Really. I'm not worried about, you know, rookie of the year. I just want the guy to continue to develop and continue to, to have a phenomenal year so that we can see a, 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 uh, next year, our number one receiver be a number one in January. So I'm excited for that. He's already established himself as the number one receiver on this offense. That's clear. But uh, it's good. It's nice to see him get that recognition or be in those conversations with those other rookies. Whereas the first half of the season, nobody even knew who or she Rice was, right? <laughs> yeah, no, he's, you know, this obscure wide receiver taken in the second round out of SMU. Although he did lead the NCAA in receiving yards last year, I mean, not a lot of stock comes from a non-Power 5 player too often. So it's 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 been refreshing to see him come in here and make the impact that he's had. Something I would like to see cleaned up a little bit is the fumbles. He did have a fumble in this game. So, you know, he's not without a little bit of criticism here and there. Just protect that ball. I feel like it's become an every other game type of thing for him. And, you know... Just don't want him to carry like a tiki barber type of narrative where he's just turning the ball over all the time, but he's also super impactful. Just like tighten up those those things, and um, it's it's going to be a lot better for for him in our offense for number four moving forward. Speaking of offensive issues, there were several drops in this game as well, right? And not even just from the typical, the usual suspects, right? We saw Kadarius Tony tip another pass. Obviously, that pissed Patrick Mahomes off. But <clears throat> yeah. with the Travis Kelsey touchdown, I mean, that hit him right in the hands. You know, and there yeah. and there were several other instances where, you know, they just didn't have have the concentration on the ball. I don't know if it's just they're ready to start moving up the field before they actually secure the pigskin, but that's the part that's escaping everybody whenever we're running our offense and it's causing these issues where we're running into third and long where we're running into field goals instead of touchdowns in the red zone where we're turning the ball over on tip passes i'm frustrated as a fan i can only imagine what mahomes has to go through to contain himself on a daily basis without just exploding we saw it kind of happen a little bit on the sideline you know you could anyone that could read lips can make out what he said and it wasn't anything you'd want to say in front of a a child. So, I mean, it was, it's definitely some (laughs) frustration there. (laughs) Yeah. I think, uh, to go into the drops. Yeah. I I think where the chiefs team is where we're at now is if we honestly just did the small things, we would never lose again. And, And this, this season, if we caught the football, if we eliminated the turnovers, if we eliminated the penalties in crucial moments, if we just did those three things, I, I'm telling you, man, nobody would be able to beat this football team. But it, we, you have to focus on the small things, the simple things, and, and get right. those right. And w- until we do, we're gonna we're gonna still only beat the Patriots by ten points, or we're still gonna drop a game when we shouldn't drop a game the last two weeks. So um, to go into Patrick Mahomes, though, I think we're starting to turn a corner with who Patrick Mahomes is going to be for the next five to eight years. The, the veteran Patrick Mahomes, right? So last five, six years, he's been the, the young gun, gunslinger who's going to rip the ball down the field and, and throw for 500 yards every single game and, and for three to five tutties, right? He's going to lead the league in 17 stats, and nobody's going to touch him. So I think what we're seeing now is really Patrick Mahomes is trying to figure out how he's going to be that veteran quarterback. Is he going to be the – the Tom Brady that's throwing tablets and screaming at people, or is he going to be, you know, the Aaron Rodgers who, who leads a different way, or is he going to be the Peyton Manning? You know, those three guys honestly got in people's asses on the sideline when people made mistakes, simple mistakes. So I think where we're starting to see this go is Mahomes is going to figure out how he's going to get that done. And, and is he going to yep. be just like those guys? Absolutely not. He's going to be his own guy. But I think he's going to start to be that quarterback where he, you know, if, looking around like nobody else is going to hold you accountable, then I'm going to be that guy because this is my football team and I'm trying to go win another another Super Bowl 
And if you don't want to be a part of that, then you can sit over here while I go sling touchdowns to, you know, the, the third string uh, tight end. It doesn't matter to me. I, I think that's where we're starting to see Mahomes transition as a leader on this football team. And honestly, after watching him frustrated again on the sideline when we were up, uh, clearly, I, I, I think I was kind of excited. I was like, okay, this is the guy – that we've needed all season. He just wasn't sure maybe yeah. how he was going to get that done or how he was going to be a leader without, you know, somebody else on the coaching staff or somebody else doing it. So I'm juiced up. I think it's going to continue to evolve this year, but I think honestly next year, I think it's going to be a completely different quarterback, completely different leader. We see out of Patrick Mahomes because he's going to figure out what, you know, what to do, how to, how to, how to handle those situations as a, as a veteran quarterback at that point. Yeah, I mean, we're getting to the point in Mahomes' career where he's starting to be that older guy in the locker room, right? He's 28, be 29 next year. I mean, that's when you start to become a seven, eight-year vet. That's when you start to become that guy that's like, okay, now now I feel like I have this, which I'm not saying he didn't have this before, but now he can be a little more public right. with his accountability and and that's or holding other yeah. people accountable. And so that's kind of what we were seeing there is, you know, he was obviously, you know, what I read was I just effing said that whenever he threw that ball and it got tipped up. So he was obviously coaching Kadarius Tony in that moment where he said, you know, yeah. give me give me something that I can work with here. Right. I want to throw you that ball. <laughs> I want to get I want to I want to get you involved. But damn it, I cannot trust you. Help me help you. Like I'm sure it's, it's <laughs> gonna be, That's got to be the help gist. me help you. Help me help you. <laughs> but no, uh, I, yeah, I, that's I mean, funny. Totally that's exactly what I was for, <laughs> I'm pumped to see what kind of stuff happens moving forward. We have three games, very winnable games where we can tune these things up, right? Get these things figured out. And, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be some, some high pressure come playoff time. If we, uh, if we, if we don't have it down. So let's, let's wrap yeah. the show with the AFC landscape. This is going to be brought to you by the Atlas saloon gracious hosts for our live show this past Sunday. So much fun going out there. Uh, I mean, just the environment for a Chiefs game. They they play the uh, the Gary Glitter track whenever we score, so you're getting that same feel from like the 1990s Arrowhead era, where you're chopping as soon as you you know you get that score instead of the fight for your right to party. So it's it's a little bit different. You know, you get a little bit of an old school vibe with that regard. Oh, yeah. But everything they're doing there is pretty awesome. The building's been around for a long time, staple in Excelsior Springs. And ever since Keith and, and company started brewing beer in 2018, uh, I just feel like, you know, that spot's grown and grown and grown. It's been so much fun to, to watch that come together too, with, with what Keith and, and uh, Jimbo is doing are doing over there. So a um, lot of fun, a lot of events throughout the week that you can check out and make sure you check them out on Thursdays, live music, free beer if you rock your Atlas t-shirt. And of course, they're going to have the Thursday night football games on. So always worth it to go and check that out. Key matchups yeah, in the AFC this interesting. week. Oh, go ahead, brother. Let me, something something that's interesting down there that, that uh, we've been a part of for a couple times this season is the rally shots. I mean, Patrick Mahomes could overthrow somebody on third down. It's like a three and out or whatever. And it's rally shots. Everybody in the bar is getting a rally <laughs> shot. And then somebody's doing a... Uh, Somebody's doing a, a you know a little anthem or whatever, and then everybody's slamming a rally shot. You probably go through, you know, five or six rally shots in the whole game, which is uh, which is just a fun part of the the vibe or the the, oh, the yeah. atmosphere down there at the Atlas. So it's a good time during the games, man. There's no really no place like it. No, it's so much fun. I I mean, anytime we get an opportunity to go out there, I'm I'm having a good time. And I know <clears throat> during the playoffs, we end up getting a road game or whatever. It's going to be a focus to to do another show out there. So uh, definitely appreciate you know the opportunity to partner with them and 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 make that a, a tradition for us here on the show. Um, some key AFC matchups yeah. for Week 15. Houston officially eliminated the Tennessee Titans. They're done. Houston maintains an eight and six record going into uh, week 16. A lot of pressure on them with CJ Stroud being out, but uh, once they get him him back, they're going to be dangerous. Buffalo dominated the Dallas Cowboys. wasn't even close. 
Uh, they they keep their playoff hopes alive. And then Baltimore destroyed Jacksonville. Big loss for Baltimore, right? Losing that running back, Keontae Mitchell. That kid was really explosive and starting to come into his own. Uh, so they're going to have to rely on Justice Hill and, and Gus Edwards moving forward. But they beat Jacksonville to maintain the one seed. And now Jacksonville's feeling pressure from Houston, Indianapolis, to you know, win the AFC South. So a lot of playoff hopes hang in the balance of whoever's going to win that division title because they all sit with the same record. And some of them are outside looking in. So big, yeah. Yeah. big shakeup in the standings too. Ravens, the one seed. Dolphins, the two. Chiefs, three. Jags, four. That all stays the same. But the wild card moves around, right? The Browns somehow have nine wins. They have the same record. If you had told me... <laughs> The Browns would have the same record as the Kansas City Chiefs going into week 16, except they don't have Deshaun Watson and Joe Flacco is going to be their starting quarterback. I would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> you are crazy. I love it. But here we I are. I love it, man. The, <laughs> the Colts are in the sixth seed and the Bengals make their way into the seventh seed. Eight and six, we're hanging in there with the rest of these teams here. Outside looking in, you got the Texans at eight and six, Bills at eight and six, Broncos and Steelers both at seven and seven. So a lot, a lot going on there for those teams, and a lot that could still happen as we move through the season. Trey, I do want to ask you this before we wrap the show: What does our path look like for the one seed? So, like I said, I, I don't see this really taking taking fruition here I, I think this is a stretch for us to get the one seed but we've seen it before right the last four years we we've seen weird stuff happen in the last three or four weeks for the chiefs to bounce into the one seed so um right now chiefs have to win out uh we can win the division um here this weekend if we beat the raiders on christmas day and uh we'll, we'll i mean what is that number number nine in a row on the division there number nine that would be, I mean, since back, 16, so 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. That'd be eighth in a row. Eight eighth in a division row. title Jeez. in a row, and that would also put us number one all time in the AFC West. Currently, there is a three or four way tie for 15 four for each tie. team. Four way tie, 15 yeah. each team. So that would put us at 16 all time, eight straight. Yeah. Wow. Impressive. But outside of the Chiefs winning out, we would also need two losses from Baltimore. Baltimore has a game against San Francisco and they play Miami. And then we would also need Miami to lose and a team that we could see that loss coming to could be Dallas. So um, those two teams, um, you know, Baltimore holding the one seed, Miami holding the two seed as it sits right now. Those two teams do have a tough road ahead of them to get into January. Um, but the Chiefs have a, a pretty soft road. We have two division games. Uh, we have the Raiders um, this weekend on Christmas Day, and then we have uh, Cincinnati the week after that, and then we travel to L.A. to play the Chargers the last weekend of the year. So um, three teams, you know, I, division games are division games. They're tough. The Raiders play us tough, but uh, we have a chance here. There is a chance. I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but I, I don't think Baltimore loses two games these last three weeks, but uh, I, I do see us potentially squeezing into that two seed. Yep. I, uh, you know, and even if we don't get the one seed, right, there's still scenarios where we could end up hosting another AFC championship game. We, we hosted one in, in 2019 when the Ravens got the one seed, they lose in the first round or the divisional round rather. And then we end up hosting that way, uh, hosting the Titans. So, a lot a lot that can still shake out to where we get some playoff football here in Kansas City late in January going into a Super Bowl. Um, obviously, we got to get through these three weeks first to see how the rest of this playoff picture shakes out. It's going to be a lot of fun yeah. as we get through that. But that's all we've got for you today. I hope everyone enjoys the show. We'll see you guys later this week to, you know, kind of do a, a little preview of the Raiders game. Raider Raider week. So going into the, the Christmas weekend, going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but Trey, as always, it's a pleasure, my man. And we will see you guys later this week. Yes, sir. Hey, be sure to go out and follow us on show, uh, social media. We're going to try to get some things kicked off here um, as we finish up the season here, to the football season. 
And uh, we want you guys to be a part of it. So go follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we have pages on each one of those at the fastest 40. Um, so be sure you're a part of the show outside of just the podcast. So um, that's all I got, baby. Dan, let's have a great week. We will see you guys Friday morning. Let's go Chiefs. Go Chiefs.